Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, Happy New Year and uh, thanks for making it. We've got a couple more topics. Uh, so this is almost like an appendix because I kind of thought we could just end 2021 by ending our discussion of, of, of Steve Grossberg's book. But we have a couple of topics which I think are reasonably interesting and sufficiently different from everything we've covered that it's worth kind of being complete about it. There's a couple of things I probably won't cover, but they kind of are rearrangements of, of all these Lego blocks. So today, uh, I'd like to talk about spectral timing, which is um, Steve's uh, model of, of in interval timing and basically timing in various um, time ranges. Uh, my thesis was on, on timing because I work with Dan. I didn't actually implement a spectral timing model. So my model was a bit different from this sort of thing, uh, but I won't really talk about that now. The curious at the end, we can talk about it. Um, okay. So I thought it would be interesting because I think when you're used to thinking about topics other than time, uh, you can uh, think that representation per takes a certain form. Um, and even when you start to say, okay, representations are a process, not a static thing, then what, it, what does it mean to, <laughs> to represent time itself? Uh, if, you, if you're not used to kind of thinking about it, it's, it's sort of like a little like, well, what is time really? Uh, it's, you know, people can say, well, time has changed. But you know, the, the real question is how you can control change. Because if something is changing in the world and you can just use a particular state of something such as the sun to, to time your actions, then you don't actually need to generate an internal uh, timing measure. But these external timing uh, devices that we use kind of give us a window into the space of what's possible for um, controlling a behavior to happen at a particular time. So I like to think of them as on the one hand, you have um, basically accumulators and our glasses are a nice uh, example of that. You have a process, it's not periodic, things gradually increase or decrease and you pick some threshold, uh, which could be zero or something else. You could you know, have little etchings on this. And so our glasses and water clocks work sort of like this. And on the uh, other hand, you have uh, clocks, which are periodic. They may be on a 24 hour time scale or 12 hour plus the seconds hand. So you, you have to not quite, you, you can use a threshold sort of, but you're sort of reading off something from the clock um, that's a state which actually repeats. Um, so you need to know what that time period is um, uh, and, and kind of be, be aware that, the, that you may be interested in the first repetition, not the one from several days from now which is completely obvious to people, but it's something that we do actually keep track of, uh, which implies that even when we're using something like a clock, we're using internal clocks or some sort of com comparison to be careful. So I would just like to make a few little asides here as some yeah, what's in circadian rhythms. So first of all, where Steve first gets interested in timing is the gated dipole can uh, simulate the superchiasmatic nucleus. Um, the second uh, point that I would like to make is, which is really important in circadian rhythms, is whether the clock is uh, what's called uh, constantly consultable or not. So one of the big differences between the two clocks you have here is one of your clocks is not constantly consultable and the other one is. Um, and that's really important when you think about the degree of prediction and precision, because if you're trying to do specifically timed behaviors. You need a constantly consultable clock. And the spectral timing system that you're gonna be discussing is a way of trying to produce a constantly consultable clock that makes a specific prediction in time. Yeah. So yeah, I have a slide which actually that, touches on that issue, which is- the that, you're, that you're really measuring the exact interval between two arbitrary, time differences, where while the SCN is constantly consultable, it does not make the same type of uh, prediction between two time points. I mean, you can measure the relative ratio of proteins that are being expressed, and that's presumably how the SCN outputs its signal, but um, or one of the ways the SCN outputs its signal mul multiple ways, but that's neither here nor there. But I just want to reinforce the notion that whether a clock is constantly consultable or not is a big deal when you're thinking about timing. Yeah, I 100%. I, I have a slide precisely on, on that topic. Um, 
So this is just my loose definition came off the top of my head today. Timer is a process that serves as an analog of the elapsed time since some event, uh, just to make things you know, very explicit. And uh, then you can ask, well, where does a sundial sit? Uh, we're not actually making any analog and the sundial itself does not change. So uh, that's a nice kind of a thing to keep in mind that, that in fact, when experimentalists are attempting to learn how le animals learn timing, they have to be, or something else, they have to actually make, be very careful. The animal isn't just using a cue uh, or just using time. Because in many cases, the, the, the animal will find something that's an easier way of performing the task that isn't what the experimentalist is focused on. So this is why when you look at behavioral studies, um, there's all these like things like uh, random intertrial intervals and uh, stuff like that to to really focus on what on something specific to, uh, that the animal has to use in order to get the task. So um, just as an aside, traditionally time has been intertwined with space, or more specifically, uh, events in the sky, on which um, the position of the sun is one, the stars is the other. Um, so. So when Einstein talked about space-time as this grand unification, there is a sense in which ancient people would be like, oh yeah, sure, um, of course they're the same. <laughs> um, anyway, so to step back uh, uh, again, even though we've talked about this a lot, I'm not going into a big tirade about representations, but what does it mean to represent something? One way to think about it, which we somehow haven't really zoomed in on um, uh, in the whole of last year was the concept of a basis set. Now, there's a sort of specific and rigorous way of the, talking about this in linear algebra, but uh, loosely, it's it's like when you have a space of possibilities, your basis set can cover all of them. So you have a, a finite number of of entities, like two vectors, that can kind of are sort of like the foot the footsteps that can be used to step everywhere in the space. Um, and those don't have to be orthogonal, but they often are um, in, in Cartesian coordinates because that makes certain things easier. So in space, we have uh, these you know, Cartesian basis sets or in other spaces, depending on the topology, something else like curvilinear coordinates might be easier to use. But, um, and, and, and I suppose once you start looking into things like Fourier transforms, you'll realize this, but it takes a little while because whereas in, in a, Euclidean space, you have a finite basis set. In, in function space, you have an infinite basis set. So it's like the set of all the sines and cosines forms a basis set for periodic functions. So, which is why the, the Fourier transform works because it, 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 there are theorems to show that you can get a unique solution with a linear combination of sines and cosines of all frequencies. Um, and more generally in any kind of space, you might have spherical harmonics for phenomena on a sphere, and that takes you to the notion of Hilbert spaces, and, and it's a short hop from there to um, quantum mechanics. So getting your basis set right uh, is, is a lot about characterizing the space and what constitutes the solution. So the solution is typically uh, in these kinds of frame, frameworks, some sort of sum over uh, your basis vectors. Um, well, they may not be vectors, but so, uh, so you can ask, well, what kind of bases are possible for, for predicting a time? So one um, way of thinking, so oscillations are pretty uh, popular, but for some reason, the striatal beat frequency model, I haven't heard much mention of it lately, but in the, in the interval timing world, which is the ability to time or anticipate things in the one second to maybe two or three minutes kind of time zone, seems to involve the basal ganglia. And one proposal um, is that Oscillatory uh, um, activity in elsewhere in the, in the cortex, uh, they basically sort of interfere. You basically take a bunch of sinusoids that have slightly different periods and use that to uh, to time a particular uh, phenomenon. And so, and striatal neurons are good for this because they are coincidence detectors. They really, really like spikes to be well aligned. Whether that helps with sinusoids is a separate matter. Um, but uh, one thing that so when I was working on this in my thesis that came up is that the issue with this, which may or may not be an issue, can anyone sort of anticipate what it is like? Um, so if you are timing something that's gonna happen once after some stimulus, and maybe you know, again, when the stimulus repeats, then using a periodic basis kind of comes with a, a slight hazard maybe, um, because you get uh, beats, you, you basically get 
the, the peak will happen again later. And you, you'll get like sort of small peaks at places other than the place where you want it to be. So you'll get a kind of non-monotonicity in principle when you try to use sinusoids to anticipate something. So you'll get like small peaks on the way to the big peak that you want, unless you very carefully kind of choose your sinusoids. It may or may not be an issue, uh, but it's something to keep in mind when you use sinusoids just to uh, for, the, for that purpose. Um, Johan, how does yeah. this square away with the fact that a lot of neurons sort of are quite more nonlinear, like they're not spiking, then they spike all of a sudden. It's not particularly sinusoidal. Maybe the like firing rate overall could be mimicked by a sinusoid, but it seems like that you've almost sort of like moving out of a domain where you could do timing, where it's pretty clear whether or not a spike happened before another spike into a much more mushy, smoothed out version where you've got this problem that you just mentioned and many others. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't think the, 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 the sinusoid idea is particularly useful. And like you said, there's a lot of all or nothing and kind of like upstates and downstates and stuff like that, that one sees. You do see ramps occasionally. So you, the, the oscillatory phenomena are typically sort of a product of, of like, this is sort of sub-threshold kind of aspect of it. So that's there, but it doesn't seem like the ideal basis for this type of a, of a model. But one thing you can say is that, uh, any kind of uh, reliable uh, phenomenon, like a, like a cell assembly, for instance, you just have a randomly connected group of cells. And as long as your input is exactly the same, it will sort of run through sort of a standard sequence. Uh, and, you, and people have tried to use that for timing. The problem with that is that it's really unstable, meaning that small amounts of noise, because you need both the inhib inhibition and excitation to prevent runaway excitation. So when you have- Or if you just took one cell out that was like the linchpin cell all of a sudden, that comes before that and you're like completely scrambled. Yeah, exactly. So, so there are stability issues uh, with that kind of thing. And, and maybe there are ways of stabilizing it. Uh, I haven't really looked into that stuff, but, but yeah, there are limits to, you know, these randomly connected um, mm -hmm. uh, systems mm -hmm. uh, because then the, the, the onus really is on the input to that, to that system to sort of do all the work of, of maintaining stability. Um, so in fact, yeah, that's one of the things you might want from a timing basis. Um, uh, but also when you, like, let's suppose you know that something's going to happen a particular amount of time later, but how early you want to respond to it may vary. And if you're using these sort of coincidence detection mechanisms, you you can be really spot on, but not particularly good at freely choosing how early to respond. So that's another potential drawback of using coincidence detection um, or, or in sinusoids and other things. Because again, it's, I, I didn't really make a plot for that, but if you just imagine a bunch of non-monotonic uh, functions of various forms, and uh, you're picking a kind of coincidence, whether they're periodic or not, doesn't matter. If you're picking a coincidence among them, like using a sum, then you'll get all these funny little you know, peaks, early peaks. Um, so not monotonicity is not necessarily guaranteed when you use a basis like that. Um, Another point um, uh, to keep in mind uh, when people are sort of new to the topic is like people who come from like a computer science or engineering kind of background will think, well, where is the clock in the brain? There's no clock in the brain. Um, there's a lot of asynchronous timing and maybe the circadian rhythm kind of gives this overall um, constraint on the timing, but, but there's a lot of on the fly uh, ability to uh, create some sort of reliable neural measurements um, or analogs. So and one way to think about it is that in order to time something, you have to actually create neural processes that are relatively independent of input from the outside world. Because they, if they were constantly being interfered uh, with by inputs, it would, it would no longer be a timer. So that's the big challenge, really. Um, anyway, we know uh, we have a reasonable amount of um, uh, like lesion study data all the, and drug related data showing which brain areas seem to be involved in, involved in different time scales. So the cerebellum, as people uh, are mostly aware, is involved in very fine timing on the handful of milliseconds up to the tens, twenties of milliseconds time scale. Then you come up to uh, interval timing, which is the domain, really important domain of voluntary action. Um, so the striatum seems to be involved in that. I think lately people have looked at a lot of uh, hippocampal involvement. I think you know Howard Eichenbaum kind of and his lab kind of single-handedly made that a common idea. Um, although I, and and the um, CA1 definitely projects to the accumbens, so it could be that the striatal involvement and the hippocampal involvement are related. 
timing uh, correlated cells have been found in prefrontal cortex also. Uh, but in some sense, you're probably going to find things that look like timers everywhere in the brain because uh, you kind of want to, well, it's a, it's a long story, but th there's a sense in which the, the consequence of some, something being timed somewhere else in the brain will sort of percolate to anywhere where decision-making is happening. Um, and yeah, at the, at, the, at the slowest levels, there's these circadian timings. And as it turns out, only recently, I, I found out that there are really, really slow molecular processes. So I was talking to Dan Bullock about, about uh, some of this learning stuff. And he said that, so it's well known that spacing between trials improves performance. And this improvement can apparently extend out to a day, like a really, really long time. Uh, so what that suggests is that uh, based on you know a lot of different angles of evidence that there are these molecular events kind of keeping track of time since an event uh, and kind of serving as a kind of inhibitory mechanism on certain types of synaptic uh, learning associated with conditioning. So the, um, the temptation to think of fast happening on the small time scale and slow happening on the large time scale should be resisted. <laughs> You'll probably find all the time scales at the very small level uh, to some extent. Um, so this is what uh, Nico was talking about. So if you do have a, a, a slow sinusoid, um, then you know for a sufficiently small window within that, for a for a process that's much faster with respect to that time scale, that will look like an accumulator. And within that zone, there's no ambiguity. So it's like saying that within a phase. So so I don't really like using phase processing as a, as a framework, but here's where you can kind of say see why it might be useful is when you go between zero and 180 degrees uh, in the phase space, you have an unambiguous representation of some sort of temporal order. Uh, once you cross that, um, the exact same value of the, of, the, of the timer can mean two different things on either side of the sinusoid. So you need additional um, kind of um, uh, machinery uh, potentially more sinusoids or something else. Um, and, and in fact, oh, in the spatial domain, the grid cell spacing kind of helps you get, a, get around this issue, that they're all with the same kind of spacing, but displaced a little bit. And then the combination of them can give you a fairly unique place cell. But we'll, we'll talk about grid cells next week. So similar can, thing will come can up. Can I just make a few other comments yes, about yes. The, the challenges of this? So. Um, one thing is that you do want the input to be able to be integrated. So for example, um, if you are, and this is again in the circadian realm, which is the realm I know uh, well, um, you know, the circadian, the, so first of all, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is special in the sense that it is the first area that was both functionally and anatomically isolated. That if you get rid of the circadian, you get rid of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the animal loses circadian behavior, period, and cannot recover it. And it's also a very local nucleus in the mm -hmm. sense that it's 20,000 neurons, you know, uh, right down at the base of the brain. Um, but the second thing is that you need to have some, some method where appropriate information is integrated, but inappropriate information is not integrated. So for example, the in the circadian cycle, what animals, especially rodents, which is what we do all this research in, uh, care about very much is seasonality. And uh, if, and in your little diagram here, um, if you're looking, if the blue line is um, average daily temperature, you care a huge amount about whether you are on the upside of that line or downside of that line because it should change your foraging behavior completely. Because if you're on the downside of that line, you have to get ready for winter. And you know we have a cue, a light cue for that. So most of circadian reset is done through light. And you, but you have to make sure you don't confuse a cloudy day with the fall, or even a cloudy set of days with the fall. So the, I, the, the, the complex circuit complexity and the circadian rhythm, of course, is all of these molecular feedback loops that have, you know, tows of, you know, on the, on the order of hours, um, have to be able to integrate into giving you not just a high pass estimate, but also a low pass estimate of what's going on in them. And- Yeah, yeah. It and, reminds me of this issue of like, Integration is only as good as what you integrate. So it's like defi defining an event 
which is sort of like when we implemented, they're sort of like basically coincidences. We, 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 there, there are these and operations we implicitly in, concoct. You see them all the time in Steve's work, these things that are multiplying each other. And those are basically the events because they, it, you have to, all these pieces have to be in place for that to count as input to some integrator. And so, so that's where things get really, really ad hoc, but it's pretty obvious that the brain is expert <laughs> at doing this sort of thing. So that brings us to spectral timing. Steve's uh, um, approach is, I think, pretty straightforward conceptually. Um, it's creating a basis. It's not a periodic basis. It's basically a spectrum of um, inverted U's. So given an input, which could be you know, the onset of a condition stimulus, you, uh, you have a bump, uh, basically tiling the entire space out to some point with these sort of uh, almost gamma distribution shaped um, profiles, which are, they could be firing profiles, or as we'll see, they could be something molecular like a calcium transient. And this is what it looks like. Uh, and it's using a mechanism. Well, I, I just implemented this. So in, in, if anyone wants the co uh, Python code, I can show you. But I thought it'd be useful to just look at it from above. So the graph on the, on the right is just like the middle thing viewed from on top, which is the, so you can kind of see what the, where the bump is and, sh and see how you simultaneously get an increase in where the peak is, but also an increase in the width of it. And this is related to something called scalar timing, or the, which is the temporal version of the Weibull phenomenon. And the, the exact version is that the standard deviation of, of, the, of a bell-shaped curve of, of the behavior will uh, tend to be proportional to the sort of peak time or the time of the main of the onset of the behavior. So um, Steve uh, has set this up uh, using a mechanism that we've already looked at, uh, which is habituative gating, um, because you have to uh, create something that can can go up and then kind of come back down again. And Steve uses these um, this transmitter depletion um, kind of idea to talk about that. So this is what it is. So you have a common input, which is the CS, which needs to basically create a bit. So when you say it's creating a basis, it's, it's like saying it's creating a set of options for, for subsequent associative learning to kind of latch onto. And the way it does that is it, it has the it inputs to these separate cells, um, which uh, then input to these weights, which decline um, uh, with, with, um, with use basically. Uh, and which we've seen in the case of the gated dipole. So, the, so you could think of the spectral timing as like the gated dipole minus the competitive aspect. So, uh, so each each um, timer is sort of unaware of the others. They're not interacting with each other, and uh, that allows you to sort of tile the space, uh, basically based on how fast the um, uh, it responds to the CS input, or how nonlinear it is. But that's how it's controlled. Um, so once you have that, uh, you have and you have an event such as a reward or a punishment, you basically treat the response as the sum of of the uh, like a weighted sum of that basis. And as you add, and this is these are simulations of the actual learning. On top is just you know the sh sort of unrolling to show all the trials and how that particular representation of when the reward is, like the timing of the reward post CS onset, gradually bumps up. Um, and cap kind of captures the the time, and as you can see, it's all it's a sort of continuous um, common. It's a combination of all almost all the uh, the relevant uh, timing uh, bumps in the vicinity. So so in in that sense, it's kind of robust because it's not depending on any one cell. It's it, there's a there's a group of them that are collectively producing that timed bump. Um, these are the equations, uh, um, and you can see here that. The, the learning is, is basically a sort of Hebbian learning. The, the only anti-Hebbian part is, is a decay. So if, if these, these cells are constantly active in the absence of the unconditioned stimulus, the reward or the, or the punishment, then that weight will gradually uh, uh, decay. So it's a fairly straightforward learning that allows you to do what's on the left here. Uh, yeah, that's that. Um, and one thing to point out with, with this model, and I think with most models, like I, like I definitely had to use this in my model, um, is, is the importance of reset, which started to really bother me because if something is this important, 
and it's kind of almost becomes a topic of its own to study, which is how um, uh, the a system decides that a, a new trial has begun. So, so I point. So, what I've done here is I just um, at the 400 time step, I shut off the input, but I didn't reset any of the activities. So, uh, this f of x basically gradually declines, and here you have the the habituative weight that does not actually reset. Doesn't really have enough time to. So, the next time I turn the the stimulus on, I kind of have the same time profile, which is nice, which is a, a good sign. But the weights are much. I mean, the the extent of the activity is lower. And Steve does a lot of work with the actual magnitudes of these things to explain the learning rates and stuff like that. He, he's put a lot of effort into that stuff, which doesn't get talked about much, but it's something that a lot of modelers simply don't think about anymore, which is why a learning rate might increase or decrease given some intervention uh, or some experimental condition. And Steve puts a lot of thought into this stuff. Um, so, so in this case, yeah, driving input from, from the CS is shut off, vegetative gates haven't returned yet. So in, in these actual stimulation simulations, Steve always resets everything. So it's a question, how does that happen? Um, and, in, and maybe it actually helps explain certain things, which is that if you don't give the, the animal enough time to reset, you may get uh, at, at the very least weaker learning or slower learning uh, or, or muddled learning, uh, which is an, another way of thinking about um, spaced repetition. Uh, and this kind of sets up a question which I like to think about in the background. I don't have a, a good answer, but animals need to kind of con construct boundaries between episodes. We call them trials. It's very easy for us to define them. But how does the animal know what a trial is? That these two things are separate, but somehow equal. <laughs> they, they come one after the other, but they somehow have to be added together, as opposed to one really, really long trial. Uh, this is something that uh, the behaviorists in their many, many uh, uh, sort of pre-auto shaping kind of studies, they've looked into all this stuff, but very often they simply reported the end of all that. So, so when I look at behavioral papers, I always like to look at the pre-training because there's quite a bit um, of, of um, training that's fairly sophisticated to get the animal, A, interested in a lever, B, willing to not give up too early. There's many, many things that happen and not enough uh, attention has been uh, given to this in the modeling community. But I think there's a lot there uh, um, that relates to things like attention and, uh, and salience that I, it's just ripe for exploration. <clears throat> anyway, so um, moving to another place where uh, spectral timing is used. So that was just a sort of general conditioning model uh, where this next model uh, with John Fiala um, was about the nictitating membrane response. So. Um, various species have a, um, this additional eyelid called the nictitating membrane, which, which can protect them. I'm not sure why exactly uh, it evolved, but this isn't a bird, the masked lapwing. And um, there's a, a classic conditioning paradigm involves um, the timing of the nictitating membrane closure in rabbits. So you have this tiny little air cuff that, uh, that you sort of uh, uh, subject the rabbit to after the onset of a light or a sound and eventually uh, and this is in this is on a fairly fast time scale on the hundred hundreds of milliseconds time scale um, and uh, the animal learns to delay the onset of that until uh, absolutely necessary a little bit before the epoch actually comes and this is a, a classic uh, example of something that's been associated with the cerebellum here's just a a uh, simplified uh, circuit uh, showing what seems to be involved. Um, and uh, so one thing to keep to note is that a lot, many, not a lot of these are inhibitory connections. So the Purkinje cells are, in, are GABAergic, they're inhibitory. And the way in which they unleash the eye blink is by disinhibition. So a little bit like how the basal ganglia works. So, so they inhibit the inhibitors of the things that produce the eye blink response. So what is learned by the Purkinje cells is when to pause. They're tonically active and they learn when to pause. And so this next model, um, so basically the CS comes on and there's any number of points in the hundreds of milliseconds range where it could pause. And eventually these cells learn to pause at the right moment. And this is the, the classic circuit. I'm sure most of you have seen this circuit. Um, but the idea is that the, um, uh, the information about the CS, the light of the sound comes in, uh, 
uh, percolates through um, uh, the system. Um, and uh, so basically they've, uh, they have these couple of places where there are adaptive weights in this model, in John Fiala's model, where uh, the timing of the, basically learning the, the gap between the onset of the stimulus and the actual air puff uh, gets learned. Um, so here's where, like Steve uses this term unlumping a lot, but this is like the most intense example of unlumping in the Grossberg world. And it's all down, down to John Fiala. I don't think any grad students before or since were willing to put in uh, the effort in making a biophysical model of this scale, as I will show you a glimpse of. So yeah, the earlier work were involved lumped neural models, which is like the, the Gross, Grossberg and um, Schmeier, the original spectral timing paper. Um, and here, um, the present work has used these model properties as a point of departure for interpreting and modeling biochemical properties of Purkin G cells in the cerebellar cortex that are consistent with the behavior. So, um, and you kind of see what might be required to really flesh out a model that starts out fairly coarse grained. Um, so yes, so the key is the MGLU-R, the metabotropic glutamate receptor. Uh, the condition stimulus activates, activates MGLU-R responses that are used for spectral timing. The CS does this by activating mossy fibers, which in turn activate granule cells whose parallel fibers synapse on Purkinje cells. The MGLU-Rs are located just outside of the synaptic junction with parallel fiber. So that's where the, the real action is. And so he's saying he's saying MGLU-R is on the parallel fibers from the granule cells. Is that right? He, they are, are, okay. Yeah, they're here. Got it. Right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oops, sorry. So this is the the meta metabolic network that he, he he found data about to kind of uh, come up with a basis, uh, but a but a molecular basis. And there's a lot happening here, which I don't fully, I cannot claim to understand. It's not my area of expertise, but recently I've been trying to beef up my understanding of this stuff. Um, but as any of you um, will, who have looked at a phosphorylation diagram will know, there's many different ways in which this particular um, beast can be uh, pushed and pulled. Um, and, and specifically uh, here he shows the the, the way that the, where the learning takes place in the form of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So all of these arrows or, or a good chunk of them are modeled as using uh, mass action laws. So, you know, in, in keeping with the, the way that biochemists do this. And uh, conveniently, the way that the, the, the shunting networks is set up is pretty much a mass action law already. So it, it kind of fits well, the, the interface reasonably well together. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot <laughs> uh, uh, just to model uh, how the kinetics of these different species of, of you know, gene products and, and calcium concentrations influence each other, all justified with a whole lot of background data. So it's, it's not like, yes, they had a, a, cor a coarse grain model in mind, but he really went through the, the data to show how you could make a spectral timing model out of molecular uh, Lego blocks. Johan, does, does Steve bring up complex versus simple spikes in the Purkinje neurons in this model at all? Uh, no, because it wasn't a spiky okay. model, so they so they didn't uh, talk about that. Uh, okay, cool, cool. He does he does talk about bursting in some of the other stuff, um, mm. which I didn't really put into this. But he, uh, in the past 10, 15 years, he's been interested in bursting in layer five cells. So that's something that we can we can look into. Um, uh, as a and yeah, he does use them for different purposes in in one of the hippocampal yeah. spectral timing models that we can look into. The, the reason I ask is that there, I read this awesome paper recently. Um, I'll have to dig up. There was it used a Star Wars pun. It was like complex spike, spike wars, a new hope, or something, um, which is always a good sign when they're that nerdy that they'll use a pun in the title of a paper. But um, the the idea was that there's a lot of uncertainty about there's like we know a lot about the cerebellar circuitry but the heuristics we use to kind of think about how it works, some of them are kind of really old school, like a Ma Albus, you know, Edo ideas that haven't really been borne out by a lot of the subsequent uh, empirical work. And if you update with the empirical work, some, there's some interesting other ways to think about what's going on. It's not necessarily about the plasticity so much. It's about this curious feature of the, the inferior olive that it wraps around the cell bodies of the Purkinje cells. And it actually causes a massive release in calcium 
whenever they um, whenever they innovate the cells and actually cause actual potential. And that can then act a lot like the apical amplification we see in the layer five parameter neurons in that nice. it can turn the simple spikes into complex spikes. And it's, it's just an interesting kind of other way to think about the system and how it's kind of similar to what we see in the cerebral cortex, but quite different in a lot of ways too. Rather, rather than it being a coincidence detection, it's more like a sort of priming effect such that it kind of like translates mm. any sim simple, simple spike into a complex spike so long as it's actually active at the same time. So it's a different kind of a way to get to the same kind of outcome of boosting some signals out of a background of the rest of the signals. Anyway, yeah. I was just really curious if Steve had talked about that or yeah. come across it. Not in this paper. It seems but quite he, powerful. He, yeah, he, he didn't revisit the cerebral limb, I, th I don't think, af after this. So he, cool. he, uh, he and, and spiky out. stuff he's only done in bits and starts. Um, but yeah, yeah but, cool. but yeah, modeling this, these kinds of kinetics, I, if you're doing it like slowly as your thesis project, it's not so nightmarish. But when you sort of come across a model like this all in one mm. piece, it's like, how where do I start uh, investigating this? But yeah, so there's a lot here. Um, but, <laughs> but what it produces is something very familiar, a spectral timing model, where uh, the, the timed spikes are calcium spikes. And uh, as a well-justified, um, meaning plausible mechanism by which the calcium spikes uh, can be like learning can happen on these on these calcium transients, and in this case, uh, since we it's a learning a pause, it has to learn to pause its uh, firing uh, in advance of the the US, which in this case is the air puff. So one thing that Steve is very interested in, and he talks about a lot in this paper, uh, in this chapter on spectral timing, um, is uh, a kind of paradox, um, which is to do with um, timing, which is when you are expecting something to happen later, what do you do in the meantime? Like if I'm expecting a reward and I know that there's not gonna be a reward happening anytime between now and then, what do I do while I'm waiting? Why do I not get distracted by something else or start exploring? Um, what mechanism prevents you from just sort of darting off? Um, because if you think about like reward prediction errors, you could imagine that that the, the absence of a of a reward initially is is kind of a signal because you're, you're having some expectation of reward, but but how do you not then decide? Hey, I'm not doing well enough. Like what what creates the patience to to wait? Whereas here, if you don't receive the reward, you do actually learn, okay, maybe the timing has changed. So some and more learning will take place with a unexpected omission of a reward here. Uh, but at the same time, if you do get an early reward, it's not like the animal cannot engage in cons cons consummatory behavior. So he's, he pays a lot of attention to this sort of issue. Um, so he paints this picture. Suppose that an animal typically receives food from a food magazine two seconds after pushing a lever and that the animal orients to the food magazine right after, right after pushing the lever, which happens a lot. Um, when the animal inspects the food magazine, it perceives a non-occurrence of food during the subsequent, like while it's waiting, there's no food. These non-occurrences disconfirm the animal's sensory expectation that food will appear in the magazine. You may not need to frame it that way, but that's how Steve frames it. Um, because the perceptual processing cycle processes the sensory information occurs at a much faster rate, than two seconds, it can compute. Well, yeah, I guess I missed that part. But yeah, so the 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 the, um, the thing that Steve's drawing everyone's attention to, and Steve Grossberg and Merrill here, uh, is that um, the animal is somehow spared from erroneously reacting to these expected non-occurrences of food during the first two seconds. And I think this is like quite a, it's sort of a sort of almost like a niche topic that I've never seen anyone mention this in, in the various papers I've read about, about conditioning. But I think it's, a, it, but possibly the people who do TD learning models are aware of this issue framed in a slightly different way. Um, so here's how I sort of frame it is that why don't we bail <laughs> on a delayed reward? What keeps us waiting? Not, and we don't wait forever either. So, so that's it. Um, and Steve enlists the Weber law property for this. I don't know that I'm convinced that this is the right thing to do, but it's an interesting thing. So basically it's the idea that the, the, uh, the response gets wider the longer the timing is. So Steve assumes that is a sign of the underlying neural basis. So, um, so he talks about this as a timing paradox. 
uh, on the one hand, in response to any fixed choice of a conditionable ISI into stimulus interval, the learned response delay approximates the ISI and thereby enables the animal to prepare appropriate response. So it help anticipate. Thus, a model of adaptive timing needs to accurately discriminate between individual temporal delays. On the other hand, expected non-occurrences throughout the ISA or while you're waiting uh, should not be treated as predictive failures. Thus, the inhibitory signal that prevents this. So he assumes there has to be some inhibition that prevents you from bailing. Uh, and that's, that's what they kind of uh, construct here with the start model, this spectrally timed adaptive resonance theory. Couldn't there just be things happening over different time scales, Johan? So like if you've got a slowly evolving variable that's evolving along the, the course of, let's say, half an hour, this is a good state for me to be in, things will generally work out, I'll be fine. And then you've got a much slower, a much faster time scale. I've just got a reward or I haven't got your, yet got a reward, even though that, that will then play out, play into the whole, well, I'm currently in a long time scale stability of I expect there to be rewards. And as long as that's sitting around and that's still active or whatever, in whatever sense, you're just going to sort of stick around. So it's, it's a little bit about holding information over a longer or shorter periods of time, I think. Exactly. So that's sort of what, yeah, that's exactly what this is doing. Oh, cool. Um, so the inhibition is because of so I just want to interject that I put a really beautiful paper into the chat. Okay. Um, this... Where Hikosaka at all? Uh, yeah, I was going to say record, he has done this stuff. Yeah. Um, only record when the, the so that they, they don't show the monkey stimulus unless they're recording in this set of work, and they have some monkeys that learn the task and some monkeys that don't. And they show differential neuro responses in the dopamine system based on whether the monkey learned the task or not. It's a beautiful thing. Cool, cool, thanks. So, 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 so yeah, so the, the timescale issue they're talking about, it, it relates to, it wouldn't be an issue if there was nothing else in the, on earth to do other mm. than wait. Um, but when there are multiple things you could be doing, like exploring, um, the, the issue is like this, that, uh, the timescale of, of waiting is the timescale at which you could decide to do something else. And uh, what maintains the lockout? Here, the idea is that once the drive is kind of initiated by the presence of the CS, mm. so the thing that predicts that there is a possible reward, that is used for a kind of inhibit, in, inhibition signal, which prevents spurious or incorrect learning. Um, so it's, it's a bit like... Uh, um, it's not something that you necessarily think about when you think about conditioning initially, just as a simple yeah. thing. But it's a. Quite I take the point. I think that makes sense ethologically. Like an animal's currently hunting for awards and then they sniff a predator, and then should they stay and get the food they're probably going to get, or should they bail? But in the kinds of contrived experiments that we typically do in neuroscience, I don't think those kinds of challenges are really present. The animal's right, stuck right. in a box. They've got to choose a thing that the experimenter says or not, and then they either choose or they don't. Um, exactly. So it's a, we're a bit we're a bit stuck there, aren't we? Like we can't really yeah. push push animals in the way that they're going to actually be pushed in the real world. Yeah, and you want there to be a competitive mechanism that's kind of in play, because uh, rather than any kind of like permanent lockout, right? Because there should be some level of say complete of threat or salience or something else. It does actually make you give up on whatever it is you thought was about to happen. So assuming that there's a competitive mechanism helps you put those kinds of uh, interrupt signals into the model later. I, I just yeah. would like to point out that I, I actually did a study with Tim Gersh and Jackie Gottlieb, where we had two different task versions. What one condition, the uh, initial stimulus that predicted the final reward was uh, immediate to the final reward. And in the other condition, there was another decision you had to make that was interposed between the initial decision and the final reward. And monkeys can do that. I mean, as long as you can train them to do, you know, a multi-step task, they can make that decision just fine. They recognize even when there's an interfering thing that they have to do, that the initial decision and the final reward are connected to are each other. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's clearly a lot more uh, ability to to like, like the back burner metaphor is really, you know, sort of right onto something. So yeah, this um, so the the Weber law kind of is how he assumes that you get the signal that can give you the inhibition. So one pathway. So there's two pathways he basically posits. 
um, one that is used to inhibit the expression of a predictive failure, uh, and the other one is used to excite the actual timed response. Uh, and, li and like I was saying, this is kind of gateway to all sorts of literature that in this paper, as well as in some more recent papers, like his paper with Dan Franklin, uh, he really kind of, uh, as a service of drawing together a whole lot of conditioning literature from the 70s onwards um, that uh, you don't often see in learning models uh, because people are interested in sort of simple uh, one size fits all <laughs> learning. Um, so, so the start model, is framed, and I'm not really going to go into the details of this, but I just thought this is just um, what it's doing, and you kind of have to. I myself have not fully understood all the things that it's trying to do, but um, as well as the inheritors, there's the I start model, which is related to autism, and the N start model to do with hippocampal cortical processing. So there's a lot that's been built up around this, uh, but all kind of related to the various. Uh, brain areas that seem to be needed temporarily for something like, a, like the amygdala and hippocampus are very important early in conditioning, but not so needed for um, remembering old conditioning. So he's in subsequent models, he's put a lot of um, effort into looking at how, how the network enables all that. So the, here this, um, there's a problem of self printing. He's using this old George Miller term. That he uses this now print um, terminology in this paper. Because um, I think the, the term reward prediction error hadn't really come into um, fashion yet at this point, um, but some of the mechanisms in here are basically reward prediction errors. Um, so yes, yeah, so self-printing, which is interesting, and I'll get to that. Then asymmetric effects of increasing CS or US intensity. I think this is really interesting that, that there's all this quantitative uh, data about changes in learning rates based on various sorts of intensity that you hardly ever hear about nowadays. Um, but you know there are definitely targets for for modeling different effects of U.S. duration. So how long the the, the punishment or the reward lasts matters for the learning uh, and uh, combinatorial explosion network pathways. I don't know. How, yeah, but well, there's there's a lot that is is being addressed here. So so this issue um, of self printing is quite interesting. So we I think all of everyone's familiar with secondary conditioning. So once a light has been associated uh, with reward. You can then use the light on its own as a secondary conditioner for a sound. Uh, and this leads to an interesting kind of tension. Um, so adaptively timed secondary conditioning could easily erase the effect of adaptively timed primary conditioning in the following way. Now, for me, this is classic Steve thinking about a problem that other people just simply wouldn't even think of. Um, in order for CS1 to act as a conditioned reinforcer, CS1 must gain control of the pathway along which the US activates its reinforcing properties. So, so basically, this new learning is making use of the evolutionarily hardwired pathway. That's what's happening now. So suppose that CS1 act activates its sensory representation, S1 via an input, I see S1, um, and that the US expressed its reinforcing properties via an input, I US pathway. Also suppose that that conditioned reinforcer um, learning enables CS1 to activate. So the learning has already taken place. <clears throat> Thereafter, presentation of CS1 just on its own would simultaneously activate both the ICS1 pathway and the IUS pathway. So it's appropriately timed pathway. So basically the, the, the pathway that has learned the, the reward is later. Uh, and as well as the immediate appearance of, of the CS causing a sort of internal spirit, like internal representation of a possible reward, which serves for secondary conditioning, would happen. So there's a tension between the appropriately timed signal and the sort of immediate control over the, um, the reward or the punishment teaching signal. So in other words, CS1 could self-print a spectrum with zero interstimulus interval. Uh, so you could end up learning a completely wrong um, uh, temporal association by virtue of the fact that that the CS can be a secondary associate. Um, so a CS becomes a conditioned reinforcer, it could undermine the timing. So that's that's something that um, he's put some effort into. So one of the things that these seemingly, in, uh, initially when you see them, why do I need all this extra inhibition? Is these kind of phenomena are being addressed. Uh, and so this is what I wonder about. I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't, see any mention of this sort of thing uh, in, in, in studies that talk, that talk about uh, you know, 
learning from reward and punishment. And they're very interesting issues. I'm not saying that Steve necessarily has the answer, but the topic is very interesting. Um, uh, like it's, it's, very, it's secondary conditioning is so intuitive that we forget how dangerous it could be if it's not calibrated just right. Uh, and this, that's, that's you know, where I, I thought I'd end because that's, um, it's an interesting thought. Um, so, and I think what's what's good about this is that if you stick with a model and 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 keep kind of developing it with an eye on the data, um, certain issues will crop up, which you can then use to kind of revisit the data. Uh, whereas if you're kind of looking at from a very kind of top down and, and jumping around from one topic to the other, you may not necessarily explore the implications of a what you've done and b what that means for the for the literature. So. Um, uh, it's, it's something to kind of really stick with the model and whichever the model happens to be and really put it through its paces or see where it really just doesn't work without adding infrastructure. Yeah, are you yeah. going to talk about the to granule cells at all? Do they come up at all in, in Steve's model or is it mainly about the CSUS pairing that he, that he focuses on? In, in, in the cerebellar granule, granule cells? In the, in the timing. Yeah, so he just assumes like that. There was a, that's this is the only cerebe cerebellar model that he developed, um, okay. and kind of didn't revisit it. Um, so he has he hasn't unlumped any further. Um, no, that's so cool. I, there's so th there's a really interesting um, feature of the of the granule cell population that actually is kind of relevant here. Um, so the, the granule cells are right, like the most uh, plentiful by number cell in the adult brain, right? They're just gigantic populations of them. And um, they all have very different uh, properties in terms of the time, uh, the particular intrinsic um, refresh rate and timing. So what, in, what generally happens, right? Well, what's thought to happen is that when the pontine nuclei receive a signal, let's say from like, you know, BET cells or some other layer five parameter neuron, then those pontine nuclei hit a tons of these granule cells, right? They spread out the signal like crazy, but because of that spread and because of the diversity of these granule cells, right? So this, this population here on the, on the left, yeah, um, yeah. these guys here, there's actually just imagine like, you know, 10 billion of them now, right? So now yeah. instead of the pontine nuclei coming and hitting one, it's actually multiple pontine nuclei just spreading out this signal. And you can imagine that if the, the, the problem was something like, um, have the the tone and the eye blink linked together, let's say in this, in this, but now you've got a slight offset. There might be a granule cell over here that responds to the, the tone, um, but it has a little bit of a sluggishness to it. And then there's similarly another one over here that responds to the tone. They both are just as receptive to that tone, but it's a bit faster. It responds really, really quickly to the tone. It'll turn out that because of that diversity of different inputs, whichever mapping you'd like to make, as long as it's within the refresh rate of those granule cells, which is, you know, it, it's long, but it's not, you know, infant, it's not infinitesimal. There is a particular time, I think it's a second or so, after which the granule cells kind of refresh and they kind of become ignorant to the particular current context. You should be able to map that timing. It's a little bit like a fudge factor in a way. It's like, if there's something in the world that happened and it's relevant for you and it's related to the current context and you really, really want to kind of adapt to that particular thing, the granule cell population gives you a bit of blurriness to the exact timing. But once it's been learnt, it then becomes sort of baked into that population. Uh, this is this, I think this is all quite speculative at the moment. Stuff I've talked to with Michael Mork about is a big cerebellar but, modeling um, guy. That, like, but then you get the timing for free from that specificity. That's the idea. Sorry, I just wanted to that, kind of bring that, that up. I don't know that, beyond that level. But that would be exactly like, like if it was um, uh, a transient, there would be a spectral timing model. Just uh, use instead of using the calcium transient, you would end up using the actual firing of the granule cell. So mm. um, the, the the details of how you get the spectrum might vary slightly, but it's the same idea. Because and the most important thing again is that the reliability of it. So that um, it's you need for those granule cells to have a systematic uh, and a sort of exhaustive set of possible responses that tile the temporal space, which is also assumed on the part of these calcium transients. Yeah, so whichever yeah, yeah. way that you get the transients, um, they have to just be in the right time scale and be relatively um, tiling that space. That the peaks need to kind of be pretty smoothly tiling the whole possibility. So you could have sort of slow tiling coming from the olive, right, with the calcium waves being a little bit slower, and they're gonna. Whoops, I've lost my little cursor. 
So you've got some slow tiling from the olive kind of coming in saying, okay, here's me mapping the space. And then you've got this extremely rapid timing, but really, really like overrepresented coming from the granule cell. And it's about trying to match them up together such that you work out the context and the specific response and how to best adaptively link them together. Right. Yeah, the learning part is actually sense. the easy part in, in those kinds of situations. Yeah. Uh, you got like, calcium. Why not make it make pl pl um, plastic change? <laughs> like just relatively simple Hebbian learning will do the trick. Um, in uh, so it's it's less about figuring out the learning than identifying um, where the source of the temporal variability is. Is it molecular or you know based on these small kind of things? And the other possibility, which which Steve doesn't talk about, which relates to my own mod model, was that can you actually just sort of um, adjust the timing of certain cells. So rather than assuming that that the peaks of something are fixed, can there be a plasticity that moves a peak around? So that way you don't have to assume all of the above. <laughs> you can kind of say, well, I have a few things that sort of are placed in strategic locations in the temporal domain, and I can move them around. And uh, there are ways to do that um, um, that may not involve the standard competitive networks that Steve uses, but they're not too implausible either. So, so, so yeah, but it could be that because the cerebellum is so good at very exquisitely fine timing, uh, both mechanisms might be useful. So imagine that you start with some broad guess uh, and then the refinement happens on top of that by tweaking of the, of, of say the cal calcium learning. So you could have both happening so that you first sort of get a quick and dirty uh, guess within some range and then you you tweak them to make this almost like making the shape of the, the curve sharper, because um, so that's a, another possibility that that um, and it may be that for different types of tasks, different timing mechanisms, even in overlapping time scales, uh, might be useful, so that you have some redundancy. So what I'm saying is you can either have a spectrum at the level of cell responses or spectrums in the synaptic responses. Both could both could be could be present. Yeah. So, any questions, comments? Okay. It gets really interesting when you start thinking about um, animals' capacities to learn responses that are outside of that tight window and and like credit assignment problems of like an animal tries something and only you know much much later do they figure out that it ended up being the problem that caused them uh, all the anguish, like going into academia. And now we like turn around and go, why am I going bald? You're like, oh, it's because you went into academia 10 years ago, you moron, right? <laughs> um, so the delayed credit assignment problem is really tricky. Yeah. And then, then you start to think about um, the capacity to hold items over a long delay or to conceptualize the things over long periods of time being really important. But they're always going to have to intersect with these kinds of faster time scales that then end up controlling your, you know, uh, ongoing Decisions. adaptive behavior. So it's really, really fun to think about this stuff. So that, so, so how Steve, you test it. Yeah, that, so you like this bit. So some of the other stuff he talks about with relate uh, are to do with um, trace conditioning. So the difference between delay conditioning and trace conditioning is that in the delay, CS stays on until the US, the reward or the punishment comes on. Whereas in the trace, uh, the CS comes on and stops so that you have to kind of uh, maintain timing in a gap. Uh, mm. So in the in this situation, apparently the hippocampus is really important um, to to f kind of fill in the gap in a way. And what's mm. really interesting, and which Steve talk, talks about in a relatively recent paper with Dan Franklin, is that it seems like to do trace conditioning, uh, humans uh, are, it's, um, actually benefit from conscious awareness. Um, uh, so. Making something it declarative, like, yeah. Yeah, so something like episodic and declarative memory actually overlaps with conditioning literature. I was not aware of this mm. whole literature, mm. um, um, but uh, that's pretty interesting, right? So, so um, when you mentioned this very, very long-term temporal credit assignment thing, I was thinking about how, let's assume the brain is spoiled for choice in terms of various molecular mechanisms that could uh, have, have left traces, because clearly it can't just be firing. But so then the challenge is to kind of um, through exploration um, sort of take turns amplifying each of those signals so that mm. they can each um, become a candidate for some sort of template matching and learning. And that's really interesting. So um, the idea that, that there's like, there could be some systematic way of amplifying 
uh, these sort of weak lurking signals, you know? Um, just like how, I mean, and this is maybe too much introspection, right? But like when you have some dim image and then you kind of spend some time thinking about why the particular image is in your head and that amplification helps you make an association that you were not otherwise able to, to make. So it's, mm. um, it's an interesting thought. Well, I, mean, I would like to point out two things that could, first of all, getting back to Hikosaka's work, because you always get back to Hikosaka's work in this type of discussion. I mean, the, the, I mean, he has the, you know, the two, the um, dorsal and ventral basal ganglia as, you know, two very different time courses of um, representative value, that mm -hmm. one is fast and flexible and one is slow and stable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would also, I, um, mention that, uh, you know, um, this is unpublished work, so I'm going to be deliberately a little bit vague about it. Uh, this is not my unpublished work. This is um, uh, Mickey Goldberg's group has found that when you're doing delayed saccad tasks um, and you're doing really long delayed saccad tasks, the, the spatial signal in LIP and DLPFC disappears after around eight seconds. Huh. And they figured out where it reappears, which they have not published yet. So I'm going to be a little coy about the area. <laughs> I will call it anatomically near the hippocampus. All right. Um, I love this, right? It's like you could imagine in the future, like some sort of review paper on where are the back burners in the brain? Wouldn't that would be like so much fun? Well, like so this. there's so, so, I mean, this work suggests that there are some back burners in the brain that maybe we haven't. Um, studied very much because the time course of experiments that we're doing with animals, you know, the animal gets bored as fuck if you're even having them. I mean, the number of monkeys that you can train to do 12 second delayed saccades, it's not a high proportion of the monkeys and we're pre-selecting the monkeys for, yeah. you know, being smart. <laughs> yeah, that's super interesting. I hope that comes out soon. Uh... It's not going to come out soon. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But I, I would tell you that the robust that the results are robust in one monkey. Okay. We're okay. waiting on monkey number two. Yeah. The other review paper that needs to happen is like individual differences in monkeys learning tasks and all the data that uh, never got published. <laughs> so I've I tried to get that project going and it just didn't quite work out. Like I wanted to get um, you know, a grad student or an RA. You know, we have Mickey Goldberg, Jackie Gottlieb, Mike Shadley. I mean, we have a huge data set of delayed saccades. Like somebody go through that and do a, you know, full, right, right. you know, panel data analysis of it. But I was ne never able to convince anybody to do it. Mm. Anyway, let's stop.